Hello, everyone. My name is Achana Santani Singhania, and I am a business advisor at BBC. I am grateful to be living, playing, and working in the unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. I invite you to write in chat on whose traditional territories are you joining us from. Neta will uh, post a link uh, in the chat uh, if you would want to use that to access whose territories you are joining us from. We'd love to hear from you. If there is any other topic that you would like us to consider during uh, to host in future webinars, please tell us the topic in the feedback poll at the end of the session. What we offer, we provide support for your small business journey. We offer financing to get businesses started and operating capital to fuel growth. We offer more flexibility than traditional lenders because we take a holistic approach and provide loans based on your business viability and not based on formulas. This means we provide loans to a diverse range of business owners. Um, we support you with integrated services, including complementary and training uh, uh, services, mentoring and business advising. Um, from essential business skills uh, development to personalized uh, business advice. We know the right questions to ask and the right resources to connect you with. Uh, we've also got a range of mentoring programs. You can connect with a network of women entrepreneurs and experts around the province of BC uh, who could inspire you. Uh, you can learn more about all our services at we-bc.ca and sign up for our e-blasts to get notified of new programs as we have a ton of great offerings coming up. Um, so today's webinar is an interesting one. Um, we'll be talking about importing goods and raw materials for production in Canada. The idea of importing can be intimidating and involves lots of questions. Uh, how to import, from where, what should we know about importing when we start off this whole process? So today we hear from two business owners who import goods for their products and learn about their importing experience. Uh, I am delighted to introduce Tony uh, De Rose EA. I hope I got your pronunciation right, Tony. Uh, uh, the, yes. founder and, the founder and CEO of Obigo and uh, Alison Bolton, the founder of Aslin Canada Trading. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, I wanted to just put it out there uh, for the audience. If you want, you can turn off your cameras and we can start off with a conversation with Tony and Alison. So Tony, maybe I can start off with you. Could you tell us a little bit more about you, your business, of course, yeah. Um, so my name is Tony, and as Archana said, I am the founder of Abigo. In 2008, I invented beeswax food wrap. I was a holistic nutritionist, and I had all this beautiful, fresh, living food. And I started to ask myself, how are we okay with lock trapping and sealing it in airtight plastic wrap? And so I wanted to make a food wrap that nature would recognize, and that would actually extend the life of your food versus kind of like the suffering food you're used to seeing in plastic wrap. So I've been in business for 14 years. I sell all around the world. Um, and I'm excited to chat with you today. Thanks so much, Alison. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see representation from across the province. That is wonderful. And thank you for the introduction and having me here. My uh, experience is from the wine industry. So my importing was for the materials because Canada does not grow cork trees. We do not really make glass bottles. So my importing was on that type of production side. And I have my own company that also does some exporting. I am primarily in marketing and communications. And I also work with Canada's Trade Facilitation Office, which is a nonprofit that works to build sustainable trade relationships between developing countries and foreign buyers. So in this case, Canadian buyers looking to buy and import from 
there's about 20 countries we Canada considers developing. I saw someone that was importing from Colombia, so there might be some connections there. And I have at the very top put a link to the TFO Canada website and a bit of a shout out there. What you want to do is register as a buyer, because if someone with a product you want to import, if a new export ready exporter from a developing country comes online into our database, you will get an email. So it's great to sign up there because they will do some matching for you. And those, it's hard to call them exporters because I'm used to Canadians always being the exporters. <laughs> those foreign companies that are producing the goods we want to bring into Canada have been trained to a Canadian standard to help them start to understand Canadian import regulations and things. So they are a step ahead of um, most people that are starting out. So thanks for having us. Oh, and I have to give a shout out to Abigo because <laughs> I did say this on our pre-call. Abigo is in all of my drawers and everyone gets one as a stocking stuffer. They are now expecting it. I'm afraid I'm you know, beholden to them because they're all excited to try the new sizes or the new patterns. So I wanna give a shout out to Tony that Abigo is awesome. And I love, I haven't heard the suffering food in plastic, but I am going to use that line when mm -hmm. I uh, go to grocery stores and say, why is this in plastic? So thank you <laughs> and off my soapbox back to you. <laughs> Thank you so much and welcome both of you. So Tony, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what is it that you're importing and how are you using it in your product? Um, so I import three uh, materials. I import my fabric from China. I import uh, resin and jojoba oil from the United States. Oh, lovely. And how are you using, I mean, that's a part of your product. Yep, all, everything I import is direct raw materials for a Beco. So awesome. And Alison, could you tell us a little bit more? And you did mention that you import corks. Do you import the bottles as well? Yes. So in my world, in the wine world, we import everything except the grape because we make Canadian VQA wine. We made it. And so that is the box. Some of the box materials can come back and forth. Sometimes it's it's Canadian supplier. And then the bottle, the cork, okay. the capsule on top that can be either plastic or metal. And then also sometimes the labels, depending again, I've imported from both the US or Canada. And then also sometimes in the wine world, you'll see bottles that are screen printed. And again, that can be done in Canada or in you know, the US or where you get your bottles done, but all of those pieces are typically things that get imported. Lovely, thank you. So Alison, I remember the pre, uh, when we, have, we had a conversation in our pre-call, you mentioned that you were working with an agent. So how did you connect with them and how has your experience been working with an agent so far? Most of our importing was through an agent and that was really beneficial because for starters, they were in BC. So they were on our time zone and they also were able to understand the Canadian aspect. So they could come to our winery and see what we needed. So it was, you know, this was, a we started out before the days of a virtual call. We had Skype, but just because we had Skype doesn't mean our suppliers across the world had Skype or an internet connection that could handle Skype. And so we loved the agent because also, although you will pay, you pay a premium, that they also de-risked it because they would bring it into Canada and some products, I would be able to go to their warehouse and inspect them before finalizing the purchase. And so there was a lot of benefits to that and where I would meet them, everything. They would cold call me because if they're selling corks, it's a nice, beautiful list call every winery that uses cork. So sometimes they would cold call me. I would certainly ask for referrals in the wine world. And I would also use, sometimes you might get help from the British Columbia or federal government in terms of suppliers. But what I really wanna say is always look at trade shows because in a wine trade show, there could be four halls. Three of them might be wine, but one is definitely suppliers. So always make time to get to that other hall and they are selling everything to do with the wine world. So that's another way that you could find both producers and sometimes their agents as well. Lovely, that is such a golden nugget of information. 
Uh, Tony, I was wondering if I could ask you this question. How did you select your vendors? Uh, tell us more about the negotiation process. How ready were the vendors to share all this gamut of documentation that you would have probably asked them for? Uh, how was that process? Um, I was quite specific in what I was looking for in a vendor. And so I was with particularly with my fabric supplier in China, I actually chose to look for other brands that were not a direct competitor of some sort, but were using sustainable fabrics and selling like a quant like volume of sustainable um, clothing, etc. And I started asking them who their suppliers were. And I used my network to find a trusted supplier through somebody else that already had a relationship with them and that was a really um personally i found that to be a high value way to find a great partner in china because i find my relationship with my chinese supplier is very um relationship based and they were very open with providing me with the documentation that i requested and more about their company because they were really trying to be aligned to this sustainable fabric um, need that I had. Um, uh, so the next question can either of you can answer it first. Um, how can importers access documentation or documents of authenticity from from Canada? For example, uh, assessing ethics or sustainable certifications. What due diligence steps should we take, importers take, uh, while choosing and working with vendors? Uh, well, in our case, we again we went through a a referral program a referral system with somebody that was already buying based on ethics and values so we knew the supplier was already coming with that built in they also did deliver us like a significant package of like this is our business and how we do business and then they all they they do um align themselves to Cert certain certifying organizations, for example, like Gotts Organic Fabric and Fairware, like a fair trade um, type doc um, certification. So we were looking for those certifications. And then finally, we certified ourselves as an e-corp business. And to earn that certification, we really had to put our suppliers through a third party vetting system. And it was them that was the third, like the B Corp organization that was kind of like took the final um, approval with who we were purchasing from. Alison, did you have any points to add to this? We relied heavily on our agents and that they knew our values and it was important. I think we would, we did um, meet these people at trade shows and, and really we kind of did it the old school way, sit down and have a meal with them and say, do we want to work with you? And, <clears throat> and so we didn't have we would have some certifications, but we would trust the documentation because, um, and heavily, and it was explicit because we have a food product, right? Just like Tony's, it's touching food. So we did that, but we did a lot. And we asked a lot of questions because how people respond to questions tells you a lot. So we asked a lot of questions. Ask a lot of questions. That is, that is profound. Um, so, did you, did either of you or did both of you get your consignment on credit or your first consignment had to be got cash down? Um, how do we better position ourselves as importers in the minds of the vendor? I would say in terms of that, we, we negotiated very hard to not have to put 100% down. Um, we would really open it to everything we would say okay 20 percent when we place the order 20 percent when it gets to the port 20 percent halfway through the sailing like we tried to piece it out to de-risk it so much um there are private companies so for exporters there's export development canada there are private companies where you can buy some insurance and i we didn't do that but that is an option if you if you need to really do that and eventually it got on a trust basis where it could kind of relax a bit and 50% because wire transfers cost money. 
you know, both to send and to receive. There are a few companies that are really reducing it. So shop around. There's private companies. Actually, a shout out to a company that I know from Victoria called Payline by ICE. It's I-C-E. And they're a Victoria company and they still do money transfers for me because they're rates were much lower than the banks, even when you're receiving money. <laughs> so um, we tried to be as creative as possible in payment. Sometimes you just had to pay upfront, but sometimes as the relationship went on, you could get to the dream state of 30 days where, where, that, would, where that would work. And again, sometimes an agent in Canada can work on your behalf because they can physically go to your winery and say, yes, look, they really exist. Here they are. And then as, as Tony had mentioned too, it's a bit of a word of mouth and it's um, a bit of a trust thing, but that's also for buying large amounts. The smaller it is, they would say, just pay it. <laughs> just, you know, they weren't open to doing too many terms on smaller orders. I share the same experience and sentiment small orders uh just pay it up front and um as our orders or as our orders got larger and were being shipped over ocean freight we negotiated like a a 30 percent up front a 20 percent when it gets support and then the other 50 percent when it um is on the ship they like to let it go as soon as it's on the ship in my experience <laughs> once they get it on there they're like okay that's it we're done so talking about shipping, uh, how did you select your shipping company? What did you do any due, did you take any due diligence steps to choose which shipping company that you, you wanted to work with? I actually didn't. Um, Angela, you might have a very, or sorry, Allison, you may have a very different experience. Uh, in my case, my supplier handles all of the shipping and it's been remarkable for us in that when the shipping rates were going through the roof, ours were not, our shipping rates stayed the same. And so I think, again, like just that deep, deep relationship train, um, I have a deep relationship with my supplier, they have, they hold relationships to a high regard, and they also have those with their shipping providers. So I'm in the, maybe in like the luckier seat where I don't deal with the shipping company until it lands in Canada. I would echo that that is my experience as well and also an excellent strategy because as Tony alluded to, those suppliers are often shipping, we can't even imagine how much they're shipping, we could never get those rates. And so to utilize their trusted relationships, because that means if something goes wrong, they have the Batman line, like they can call and say we ship millions of dollars with you, where is this, whereas they're like, leave a message, Allison, you know? So I would use those suppliers relationships. Of course, watch them, never assume anything, get in touch with them, have their email addresses, have their contacts in case something does go wrong. Ideally, that shipping company is gonna have a Canadian office. And if you're dealing with Asia, they should even have a Vancouver office. So go out there and make that relationship too. And then if you have an agent, often, they are the ones dealing with that. So they have the direct connection. Again, no one cares about your shipment more than you do. So don't like ignore it, but do utilize some of those resources that they already have. Now for the million dollar question. Supply chain, how did it affect your business? How does it, what is the impact of supply chain irregularities in importing in the entire importing process? I'll, I won't speak necessarily to supply chain issues during the pandemic. I'll just touch on um, something that happened well before the pandemic. Because I am purchasing fabric um, and it is coming from China, something that a lot of people don't know is that China will impose really strict environmental standards kind of like at the drop of a hat. If they decide that they want shit to be, excuse my language, to be cleaned up, it happens right now. And so at a period in my uh, relationship with my supplier, China closed down 50% of their textile mills because they were too uh, damaging environmentally. And my supplier called me and told me immediately what was happening and said, you know, like, we, they didn't get shut down because they met the standards. Um, but what the impact of that is like now everybody was looking for new suppliers. And so um, having that strong relationship, I kind of got to the front of the line 
of an order. And so just recognizing that supply, we talk about a lot of, there's obviously supply chain issues have been absolutely top of mind. There's shortages, there's higher demand, et cetera. But I will say it over and over and again, having a really great relationship with your partner kind of like puts you in the catbird seat when things are happening because we do not have any control over the Chinese government and when they decide they want to make a change and they're fast and fierce <laughs> and it happens right now. And that is a good point also for documents. Documentation can change, not in Canada. So as importers, you're, you're a little less affected by that but do know that if you're importing something and then exporting it again back to a country or to China like once you've processed something that those can change as well supply chain issues I think it follows on my previous comment stay on top of it don't just say oh the container is going to arrive in six weeks and put a calendar reminder for six weeks -uh -uh. check on that shipment weekly I had a boat make an unplanned stop in Germany what are you kidding me like what do you mean the boats accidentally stopping in germany from its way to italy to montreal yep again just like tony said they're not taking my calls they're not i have no control over that but the reason is is because i checked in on that so i could find that so i could push my whole schedule back and you know i say it's like a renovation it's going to take longer than you think quite often. And sometimes it's shipping, sometimes it's paperwork. And one thing we did was we did a big overhaul and changed a lot of our suppliers to ship into the port of Vancouver because there were so many headaches going into the port of Montreal and then getting on a train or having to get on a truck. And then also the emissions, you know, it might be six of one, half dozen of the other, but if it came direct into Vancouver, there was, I had a much better chance of getting my hands on that than if it came into the port of Montreal. So we made a decision to really do a big shift and stop because there were just too many headaches into the port of Montreal. One, sorry, one thing to add on that is like you, when you're planning your, your supply orders, make sure you've put in like a really good lead time for yourself. Like there's, you cannot count on ship on demand because if you count on ship on demand, you're going to be paying air freight and then you're going to regret that immensely. Air freight is outrageously expensive. Uh, in fact, actually, to take your uh, comment a little bit forward, Tony, how important is it for an importer to incorporate that in their cash flow? Does it impact critical. their cash flow? Critical. It's absolutely critical. Those will be the those are those are your biggest expenses. And if you um, there's two major issues that will come up if you're not watching your cash flow and you're not planning for these big purchases and you don't have any credit facilities in place to make your big purchases, you have two problems. A, you may not be able to order and then you will run out of inventory and then you have nothing to sell. B, you may find yourself not being able to, if you've negotiated terms where you've split it between place the order, ship the order, get it to port, um, you may not be able to pay one of those points and that will absolutely destroy your credit with your supplier so i'm sure everybody that running a business has heard it a million times but cash flow forecasting is the absolute most important financial um, piece of data in my opinion in the way that my business runs that you need to be on top of yeah we always had a credit line at the ready like, yeah <laughs> and we strategically asked the bank to give us a credit line when we had lots of money in the bank <laughs> we did not, you know, the classic, they'll give you money when you don't need it, but not when you do. So mm -hmm. we had that and it was just, you know, in a perfect world, we kept it at zero, but it was always there as an emergency. And we did get that when we were in a great financial spot in the wine world. That's after Christmas. That's after Chinese New Year. So that's when we would make sure we had it for slimmer time. So that's important for anybody. Um importing from China is understanding Chinese New Year. Imports absolutely stop. So you need to, I mean, that's that will come up a bit later about like understanding your supplier, the culture, what's important to them. Chinese New Year will absolutely impact you and your lead time. So you would need to understand it. And Europe, Italy closes <laughs> for the month of August, which Very sounds fun. fun and lovely, but it's not. <laughs> if you need anything, it's not fun. But that's a great point. Yeah, plan well in advance or again a benefit of an agent is they might have stock in canada 
if you buy a common product. For us, we had, so, so if you look at wine corks, quite often they're branded. Those, they actually imported plain corks and then they could brand them on demand. So we were able to do that if there was a, a supply or something issue, but it was more often when, I won't just pick on Italy, when Europe closes for August and we hadn't planned well, that was a, a backup to have, but definitely plan around, you know, just like I say, if, if someone was coming to Canada on a business trip, you would not ever suggest that they schedule meetings for December 24th. Really not, you know, so just that's the type of mentality to have for other cultures. Excellent point there. So during this entire process, did you use uh, brokerage services like customs brokers, clearing agents? Uh, and if you did, why? I use a customs broker. Um, I, I lean toward the path of least resistance and a customs broker absolutely knows exactly what to do. And I could, I could have spent a lot of time developing myself on that side of the business, but I, I feel very strongly about aligning to professionals. So I would hundred percent suggest using a custom broker. I like that line aligning with professionals. Right. Most of us won't do our own business taxes and we should not write our own contracts if we're not a lawyer. So I think that's a great way to say it. Um, however, we would use customs brokers for most of them. But sometimes we did start to do stuff on our own because we were dealing with alcohol. We ended up knowing alcohol. This was for exporting. We didn't import any. It was, it was better for us because we had more knowledge on alcohol documents than customs brokers. So again, double check what they're doing because no one cares about your shipments more than you do. And so the first few times I always recommend using a customs broker. And then if it's something you enjoy, if you have this awesome admin headset and you've got this team that just rolls through, you know, do the pros and cons and what's their time value versus money for what a customs broker but a key benefit of a customs workers too. One, they live and breathe this all day, but they also probably have offices around the world that can work as you're sleeping. They can be working on things around the clock. So that's interesting. Um, so talking about you know pricing, how how important is it is it to account or how does an importer go about accounting for importing costs? And how does an importer determine the price of the product? Uh, well, that's such a that's such a complex. That's a whole webinar. <laughs> <laughs> pricing is an entire webinar. Absolutely, I completely agree. Because I mean, there's two sides of pricing. There's the pricing where you determine what it actually costs you to do. Um, to sell your product, like what the bare bones of that product would actually cost and how you can make it profitable. And then there's pricing for the market. And your pricing for the market may be well, maybe much higher than what it would actually cost you to make it. So I would be open to having like a whole pricing conversation. But the short answer is put your importing costs into your cost of goods sold at the bottom line. But that's that's a minor part of the pricing strategy, in my opinion. Yeah, I would echo that. Yeah, pricing is critical. It's the most important aspect of getting a business where it needs to be. Awesome. Okay, so how do you go about uh, quality control? Uh, what you know, what do you do when you find defects in your imported goods? What happens then? I've experienced this personally. Um, I, yeah, we've we've had a few occasions where either there was an issue with the print and it was kind of small and minor, like the print on our fabric. And then we also had a is issue at COVID where our order came in, everything kind of shut down, our material went into storage so we didn't get to inspect it right away. Um, and it turns out the, the material was made in a, in a way that we weren't, entirely happy with it was still good but it wasn't our best and um and we didn't catch it soon enough because we didn't have a really tight receiving process so we couldn't really have that conversation six months later with our supplier to say oh hey we only looked at it now we're not happy with this so 
you need to put in like a good receiving process and kind of a checklist of like what you look for when it arrives. Um, and then I also think it's really important to understand, to come to an understanding with your supplier of like, what is the margin for error? Because we all think like we should receive everything perfect, but that's actually just not the, the fact of the matter when somebody's producing something for you, there is a margin for error and you need to kind of understand what that is. And it's if it's within that margin, that's one of the things that you work into your pricing. You don't necessarily negotiate that with your supplier. I have so many stories on this, <laughs> but I think a receiving process is a great way. Inspect it as soon as you get it. Pretend it's a gift. You want to open it right away and you want to let people know what you think of it, good or bad. <laughs> and that I have horror stories. I got a shipment of glass bottles that if you set them on a table, they did not stand up. They fell over. So good luck with that. Uh, again, good relationships you're in trouble then and that's I did lean on people that also import you know the nice thing is about if you import a generic bottle there's someone in the Okanagan that also imports that bottle so I begged and pleaded and drove around with the truck and and borrowed and later returned glass bottles to people for a, a bottling but also that's an agent they might have stock so I um called up agents and said, what do you have? And I was buying pallet by pallet, which was, which was not ideal, but it was a backup plan. But yes, have a tight receiving process so you know what you're getting. In a perfect world, we started just taking photos of everything and asking the manufacturers to do that as well. So when I exported a pallet of wine, I took pictures of that pallet beautifully cornered and wrapped on a nice, you know, heat treated kiln dried pallet. Like I showed it on the truck. That also helps for insurance. If it lands somewhere not good, you're like, this is what it is. And then, so we asked manufacturers to do the same. Take a picture of our, our order. Show us, you know, show us a bag of corks. Show us the glass bottles um, and be specific. You know, I don't. So here's a glass bottle oh, from a good woman owned business in Vancouver from Woodlot. But so when you get a glass bottle, they look fine. But what the important thing is, is this mouth width here. And these, because you heat glass bottles, if the heating is uneven, these might be different. When you go to fill something, it's actually a process where the filler comes down, the bottle flips up, fills it and puts it down again. If that has a variance, you can wreck the machine, which is hundreds of thousands of dollars, or glass bottles will break. All of a sudden you have a bunch of broken glass on a food production line. Let me know how that goes for you. So be really specific about all the little details of it and you will only learn those when things go wrong and that's okay <laughs> but don't be afraid to be specific about all the nits and nitty gritty bits about your what you're expecting and it's always best to negotiate those when everything's hunky-dory and you're getting along it's hard it's hard to come back when there's tension yeah those are such incredible points to keep in mind so in your entire process of importing, what is that one thing that really worked well for you? And what is that one thing that just didn't play out? I feel I'm really fortunate. I'm going to steal Tony's. I'm going to steal Tony's because it's a relationship. It's yeah. having good relationships and and keeping those ongoing. And you wanna be a bit cheeky. I always knew who my backup supplier was. Yep. You know, it's not like a restaurant only buys my wine. They have a whole list of on their wine menu, right? Um, so I think relationships are important for importing. Um, keeping in touch with all of the people in your supply chain and going to visit them just like you would go to visit customers. Those are my tips. So it's based, it's really around relationship because they're going to help you or not. And um, so that's the positive. Did you want me to say something bad about importing? Have yes, been... what just didn't work for you? <laughs> what didn't work for Because us? we're going to learn from you and your experiences. So we don't repeat on this, those mistakes. I think um, mistakes are believing timelines. <laughs> <laughs> and you know not including that buffer that's where I think I would say we got burned aside you know so I would say it's the relationships 
it will save the day because timelines will keep you up at night. Lovely. Yeah, so I would say, okay, so on the, again, like it, we keep talking about relationships, but the critical part to having a good relationship with a person who is working and doing business in another country is understanding how doing business is culturally different. For example, doing business in China and working with a Chinese partner is very, very different. Your emails cannot start with, hey, I need an order. They need to start with, um, I hope things have been going well for you. I, I hope that your family is prosperous and that things are like, you know, you, you have to start with pleasantries and that kind of like more formal, it's a more formal email and it's a more formal check-in. I think that's really, really important before you get down to business. It's always pleasantries over business in any interaction I've had with my Chinese partners. Um, so that's a good way to build a good relationship is understanding the cultural differences, understanding the holidays that they're celebrating. And um, like Allison said, you need to stay in touch with them even when you're not placing an order. So, you know, I, I regularly check in with my partners, even though that my orders are very well spaced apart, just to understand if there's any changes in the industry that I need to know. If, um, if I'm looking for something new, if I'm looking for a new product, I would reach out to my current suppliers. If it's something, for example, I need a paper product, I would reach out to my textile partner to say like do you have any contacts because they do a lot of their business based on relationships too and they love putting you in touch with a new partner and it's just it's just really important to understand that you do not have a supplier you have an endless resource and if you manage that with a lot of um if you treat that with the importance that it is you will have a long-term um you'll have long-term business success it's really important and what's that one thing that just didn't work? The biggest mistake I ever made, and I'll never do it again, is I had placed a large order for fabric and I didn't have room in my facility. So I put it in third party storage on the Vancouver side. And that was where I didn't receive it right away. And that was the order that was produced incorrectly. And because I, because I made the choice not to physically inspect it myself, I could not go back to my supplier and say, this didn't work for me. So it was a moving forward conversation where I said, that can't happen again. This is how we like it. The product was still good, but um, I would never do that again. You need to, when you order something and buy it, the minute it lands on, the minute it lands on the ship, it's yours. So you need to take full responsibility for it. It's your job. <laughs> So while we open up questions to the audience and audience, you can just put in your questions in chat. Um, I'd like to ask uh, you, Alison, what is that one, um, you know, importing can be scary when you started uh, initially and when you started, when you start importing first time, what is that one piece of advice or words of wisdom that you want to share with the importers on, uh, on call with us right now? To say know what you want seems a bit baseline, but go look at similar products on Canadian shelves. One, for a lot of reasons, because, and I know that most people think, well, we're importing something totally different. Well, you're going to have competitors for that $50 spend. So who are they, you know, every look at the packaging, look at if there's any Canadian labeling, how do they do their French English split? Um, look for where it comes from. And I think that, you know, you want to know what you are going to get and you want to know how to position it and you want to start early enough because you don't want to do anything in a panic. But I think sometimes we are so focused on our genius idea that we forget to go out and look and get some other ideas, especially when you have to label, especially if it's like a food product that you have to label specifically you know, go see what the giant companies, if Unilever has a similar product, go look at their labeling because they are doing it right. And that actually ties into the Tony's comment about aligning yourself with experts. Don't use Google Translate for your labels or for anything. <laughs> Pay for it. There's some great nonprofits in um, Vancouver, Success, and um, the Immigrant Services Society of BC, I believe both have 
professional translations in more languages than I knew existed. Um, so, and it's a purpose-driven organization, so that's great. So I think sometimes we get so focused on one product to really step back and see where you can learn. We learned about packaging from tea. One of our biggest markets was Asia. So we would look how beautiful tea is packaged and go, we need to up our packaging game. You know, we can't compete when there's beautiful things and we're not in the tea industry, but we're in high end gift industry. So I would say, because now that's, and then in terms of importing, I had one and I've forgotten it. So if, I, if that bit of wisdom comes back, I'll share it. Tony, did you have anything to share with our first time importers? Sure. Um, I would say, be careful of your blinders. And I see this a lot in the sustainability eco trending type products is that um, we kind of get stuck on an ideal like made in Canada, for example. I love Maine and Canada, Abigo is Maine and Canada, but not everything that goes into Abigo comes from Canada. And in fact, it's just not possible to have that come from Canada. So when you take a really hard line and maybe um, a really vocal stance that you are only supporting Canadian partners, you're only doing this in Canada, et cetera, you are kind of cutting yourself off from the rest of the world. And when you want to make a pivot as a brand, your consumer base may hold you hostage in a way you didn't expect. So it's really, really important to have ethics, but made in Canada or made in a certain place is not an ethic. It's a check mark. Um, you need to think about what your ethics are and who out in the world can support you on bringing that to market. Don't go for the check boxes because you will be handcuffed when you need to make a pivot. Thanks, Rose. So uh, since our audience is a quiet lot and I haven't received any questions yet, I had another sort of question. Uh, is there any advice that you could give some, you know, some importers on call who are importing the entire product in its entirety and just reselling it, um, you know, in Canada? Any things that they should do differently or think differently? I think there's a few bits on that. One is is really know your pricing because the more finished the product is, likely your duties are going to be higher. So really know what those duties are. See if you can work with a free trade company. Canada has, what are we at? We're at 14 agreements with 40 countries or better than that. So use that or a TFO plug is look to a developing country and there's a special tariff classification called the LDCT, the least developed country tariff. And that means because developed nations around the world want to encourage trade with developing nations to help them bring up their standard of living, that countries like Canada will give them basically a break on their tariffs, on the import duties, even if we don't have a free trade agreement with them. So if you're choosing between two countries and I'm gonna, I don't have a great example, but maybe, okay, Brazil and Mexico. Mexico, we have a free trade agreement with. Brazil, we don't yet. Um, or Colombia might be, we have a free trade agreement with them, but maybe you're considering with Panama, Oh shoot, we have free trade agreements with all these countries. <laughs> but compare those countries um, when you're importing that fully formed item. And I think a bit on what Tony had said, consumers are looking for more ethical purchases, more Canadiana purchases. So see if you can incorporate something in Canada. Um, or Canadian values, maybe don't have it wrapped in so much plastic, don't have it come full of packing peanuts that are plastic, you know, take your audience into account, because likely you're going to have a harder battle, even though you might have a great price on something, consumers I feel in some categories are starting to look at things a little closer about the whole value chain and if it aligns with their values. So do what you can. Again, it's like looking at the whole market. What are you competing with? You're not just competing with one thing. You're competing with opportunities for that dollar. Absolutely. Tony, did you have any uh, advice? 
I've never imported a complete product at this point. So um, I don't really have a lot. I, I can't see, I personally don't know what would be that different along the way. I, I totally hear what Allison has said about the packaging. Um, that could be a challenge, but oh, I don't, I don't feel like I can really add value to that. And did either of you uh, opt to get an advanced ruling for your products before importing it? I did not. Um, and I invented a Bego. So like when beeswax wrap came on the market, like nobody knew what the hell it was or how to classify it or where to put it or, you know, and I, I honestly, I just like read through different rulings that already existed. Um, and I just chose one that I felt like, yeah, I'm, I'm most close to this, like to this day, you can't go through the tariff, um, through the tariff documentation and find a, a tariff code for beeswax wrap. So I don't know what all the other brands are using, but um, I found the one that worked for me and that's that's what I use. <laughs> I figure it's kind of like a beg for forgiveness scenario, in my opinion. At some point they may say that was not the correct ruling and that's that's the, in my case, that's what I will deal with it because there was no product like this on the market. Here's to one day getting a whole classification for beeswax wraps. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're taking over the world. Um, I'm just looking at that question in there. I think, do you send, does WeBC send out a follow-up email? Yes, WeBC does send out a follow-up email. And I had uh, something to add to that question as well. Did you want to go first, Alison? Well, I we've never used advanced rulings, but I would, I think based on some because our things like glass bottles, corks, labels, they are very well defined. So there wasn't anything, you know, there was nothing new about it, but definitely that's when you want to use a customs broker. And you also want to ask your supplier because if they're selling to other countries, the beautiful thing about the tariff code system, the harmonized codes, they're called harmonized because they are harmonized around, you know, 98% of the world's trade uses these codes. They're the 10 digit codes the first six are universal. So if your supplier is selling to the States, selling to Australia, selling to anywhere, they should know, again, no one cares about your shipment more than you do. So you're gonna double check this, but you wanna start with those six because there's 99 chapters and the book is about that big. So you want to narrow it down. Um, and then if, it's, if you're still not sure, and it's gonna be a major uh, place it's going, and you want to use a free trade agreement as well, like specifically to Europe, because they have a lot of specifications, both on the ESG side and getting, you know, free trade status. I would do that. Sometimes you have to pay for it in various countries. I think you do have to pay for it, but I think it can be useful if you're a little nervous and you're not sure where you go. And also you can call Canada Border Services agents. They are in my home province of Manitoba. They are very friendly. They cannot give you full advice, but they can talk you through it because they can see notes that we don't as public have access to. So it's worth spending, you know, 45 minutes on the phone with one of them to talk about your product and see if they can offer any advice. Thank you for that. So I have a couple of questions here. Uh, Luisa, uh, you mentioned, is there any, uh, is there some organization that can help you with imp the importing process, et cetera? So VBC has complimentary business advisory for importing and exporting. We can help you on a very high level through the process and we can uh, direct you to resources that may be more helpful. Um, and then we had a question from Alison. Um, and this is the question for either or both of you all. Uh, uh, when you first created your cash flow for your first bulk purchase, how did you consider how much product you needed to import? Did that impact which supplier would work for you? She asks. I mean, Abigo has always been really bootstrapped. So I started this company with $1,500 and a credit card. <laughs> that was it. I've never had outside financing besides, you know, like the bank relationship I've developed. And we, and uh, I guess it was not WeBC then, but a loan through this organization. Um, and so I did not get to start with like the fully printed 
fabric that I use today because I would not have been able to meet the minimums. So I started with something a little bit different until I was able to work up to the min minimums with my supplier, which are quite high when you're when you're going to a printed material. But with my first shipment, I did an air shipment knowing it was going to cost a fortune, but I didn't understand. I couldn't wait. I was kind of going through the process. So um, I did an air shipment and then I did a bigger shipment until I was at the point of like ordering container loads of, of material. And so it was it was a bit of a structured um, process and certainly I lost a, I had higher expenses earlier than I do have today but I learned a lot and I think a, a lot of you are in business and maybe you're in business for the first time and you just need to treat it like your education you know like we're all comfortable going to school for years on years on years to get your master's degree but like right now you're in importing 101 and in five years from now you're going to be in a master's master's level importing and that's totally okay it's considered an investment in yourself to take the risk take it slow and learn how to do it because you, once you have that knowledge and wisdom you can't lose it so that I'm not sure if that answers it exactly um, I started with a small order so cash flow was more flexible and over time I had more cash and I could order more <laughs> I think Tony summed that up beautifully nothing more to add on that uh, any other questions If not, let me proceed with thanking you, Alison and Tony, for these incredible answers. Lots to learn from your experiences. Lots of points to keep in mind as well. Um, I'd like to bring your notice to the couple of uh, upcoming webinars that we have. We've got a financial fitness uh, series that starts on Jan uh, 19. And then Feb starts off with our building your HR strategy toolkit. It's a three-part series. Um, I would uh, request you to sign up for our e-newsletters and e-blast to stay updated. Um, you can go to we-bc.ca. Uh, we will be launching a feedback poll before we finish the session. I'd like to ask you for your feedback by taking a quick poll. Netta will post the poll. Um, you could also add what other sessions you want us to cover in the future here. And I did note that one couple of uh, participants requested for a pricing. So maybe we can have Tony and Alison over for a pricing webinar next. <laughs> Uh, Archana. Pardon? Hi, Archana. Sorry, I just had one last question for Tony and Allison, um, and I did put it in the chat, but uh, have you ever worked with uh, with Chinese-based websites um, like Alibaba, and I know there's a bunch of other ones, uh, and just imported straight off of the, the websites rather than finding your own suppliers? I personally have not. Um, I, my hesitancy with those kind of platforms is that you have no, um, you have no idea really who you're purchasing from. Um, it's to understand the ethics of that company or the quality of the product that you're going to receive, et cetera. I, I, I've never really explored that territory. I haven't either. We we didn't. Um, that route when we started was not open to us. True. So yeah, it, it wasn't true. there. But I do think that's. I think there are seminars entirely on buying from Alibaba. <laughs> so there you go. There's another WBC seminar. Um, I think it's it is very tempting and sometimes can be great for smaller orders, yeah. but this is not buying a one click thing, really do your due diligence, really try and cross reference what they're saying, ask for references, ask hard questions, because you want to find out they can't answer them before you give them your credit card. So ask tough questions and some will disappear. And there's your answer right there. Yep. So just um, know that be cautious, but it's an opportunity and a lot of people do it, especially for those pre made items. But yep. know that if it's a great deal, then there's probably a lot of other people. So really do your due diligence on your market acceptance first. Great advice, thank you. 
and Archana, if we can do an Alibaba session, maybe through EBC, mm -hmm. that'd be great. <laughs> oh, for sure. So just add it to the end poll and we can consider that. I want to thank you all for joining us today. Be sure to sign up for our e-newsletters uh, to stay informed about our services. Goodbye, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Tony and Alison. Thanks for Bye. having me. Bye. Bye.